This is Jeff Weiss with part two of unit four of biology of plant propagation. And I wanted to pick up uh, and very quickly go through a few uh, slides that uh, talk about some of the big ideas uh, in science that, and how they apply to plant propagation. So I am going to do this in a very few number of slides, which will give you nothing more than an overview. but. Um, I want to step through this uh, busy slide and um, start out with uh, the, 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 the cell, whether it's plant or a human cell or an animal cell, it doesn't matter. Talk about the significance of uh, genetics and how they work. And then step up to talk about how um, this information is used for uh, plant breeding and plant propagation. So here goes. Let's see how it goes. Um, so first, um, uh, genetics is the science that studies the heredity and the variation in organisms as transferred through their genes. So uh, we'll learn in a few moments that there's two elements of this. One is the genotype. That's the actual genes that are um, uh, contained within the cells and organs and tissues of, of plants. And the other is the phenotype. That's what we can observe. Um, so uh, we'll get into that in a moment. But uh, each cell uh, where all this genetics takes place has one nucleus. And inside that nucleus is DNA, uh, which is the component of chromosomes. And each nucleus has within it uh, many chromosomes and the number of chromosomes to uh, varies by um, uh, the species. Um, chromosomes have many, many, many genes within them. So uh, in the case of the human genome, there are literally thousands and thousands of genes. Each of those genes uh, may have uh, alleles or alternative forms of the genes. Um, and when plants reproduce, uh, one allele goes with each sex cell or gamete. So uh, only one of the uh, two or more alternate forms of the genes uh, gets passed on uh, in sexual reproduction. Now those uh, alleles uh, uh, may be uh, dominant, recessive, or complex. And this is now within the realm of uh, Mendelian genetics. Gregor, Gregor Mendel was the monk that we talked about last week uh, who uh, observed uh, uh, sweet peas growing in his garden and he chose a great uh, uh, plant and great examples uh, to demonstrate uh, dominant, recessive, uh, and co-dominant genes. Now these uh, gene pairs may be homozygous uh, in other words, they're the same or very similar, or heterozygous, uh, different. And we'll get a quick example of this in another slide or two. But stepping up a level and trying to bring this home to you is that genes and their expression take place through uh, uh, proteins. And the proteins get the genetic information from the DNA through RNA uh, in the presence of hormones. And it is these uh, proteins that determine the appearance, the development, the responses, the reproduction, and everything else about, uh, about uh, plants. So uh, genetics is translated throughout the life cycle of plants uh, through the um, creation and um, uh, action of proteins. And we're going to go through this in a tiny number of slides and you're going to have to dig deeper into um, into these topics if you really want to get a good understanding. However, um, where this comes into play now for uh, plant breeders and plant propagations is that our selection of these uh, genes, uh, in other words when we go through and determine which plants have the desired or the superior characteristics that we're trying to um, preserve and perpetuate and propagate, then we are selecting against all of the other uh, genes uh, and we are uh, striving to um, improve the genetics over time and to uh, 
um, create a selection for just those uh, plants with the severe with the superior traits and the superior genetics and that's how uh, genetics underlies our work as uh, uh, plant propagators and horticulturalists uh, so I hope this was uh, helpful uh, in giving you the context in which we are studying genetics cell division um, uh, the action of uh, DNA, RNA, uh, hormones and proteins, and then finally the uh, life cycles of plants. Uh, and these ideas will resurface uh, throughout the rest of this uh, course. So here's the um, some of the basics, two slides with some of the basics of Mendelian genetics. So genotype is the trait uh, that is uh, uh, held within the uh, DNA of a plant. In this case, uh, the uh, in the first case, uh, the uh, genotype is um, for a dominant uh, allele of red flower color. So any flower that has either the large A, large A, large A, small A combination uh, will show the will express uh, that. Uh, a genotype will express the red color and only the small a small a will uh, the the recessive trait will express the uh, white flower color um, and, and the phenotype is the red color or the white color and the um, the trait is um, uh, heterozygous in the double a combination or the uh, in the in the large a large a or small a small a combination and it's heterozygous, uh, especially when we go to the second case of the codominant gene where the double A, uh, large A, large A determines red color, the large A, small A determines pink color, and the small A, small A is still white. Uh, that is a um, codominant um, expression of a gene, and in the case of the heterozygous, uh, large A, small A uh, combination, a pink intermediate flower color expresses, and that is a, um, a separate phenotype. So you're going to get some more examples of this, and in fact your uh, assignment is to create something called a Punnett square that shows what happens when you combine these uh, various uh, genetic traits. How this applies, uh, or one way that this applies in horticulture, is that when we plant hybrid seeds, we are actually purchasing uh, plants that have been bred to the F1 um, uh, generation. So that when we plant those seeds, uh, they can be heterozygous, large A, small A, um, but all of the flowers um, come out to the red color. And one of the reasons why we are not successful in maintaining uh, the phenotype in the F2 generation is that when you cross hybrid seeds, then you are um, going to see some percentage of the um, recessive trait being expressed. And that is, uh, for many horticultural plants, uh, an unacceptable um, situation for customers to per uh, to sell seeds to customers and to have them plant seeds that are going to show up with undesirable traits. Um, and and you see in the uh, in the illustration a small example of a Punnett square uh, with the um, traits large a small a arrayed across and the squares uh, showing how those uh, genes can be expressed. And you're going to get into more of this in one of the videos by Mr. Anderson, the high school science teacher, and he will give you uh, one Punnett square question as part of your assignment for, uh, for this week. So now we will quickly go to the question of how genes transfer uh, the information. So the DNA uh, illustrated here, it's the double helix structure, the two spiral um, uh, chemical uh, uh, lattices connected by a cross uh, structure of uh, chemicals called ACG.
G and T. Uh, that DNA uh, will um, uh, come apart and through a process called transcription will transfer the information uh, to a new chemical called RNA. There, as you'll read in your assignment, there's two forms of RNA, two principal forms of RNA, messenger RNA and microRNA, uh, but they carry that information from the DNA out into the cytoplasm of cells and through a process called translation, uh, transfer that information to various proteins. And uh, the uh, process is pretty incredible, uh, but all of the processes that occur in our uh, cells, indeed in the cells of plants, uh, and the responses that plants have to uh, both the uh, genetics that they inherit from their uh, parent plants and the environmental influences that they experience throughout their life cycle all are expressed uh, through, the, uh, through the DNA to the RNA uh, to the proteins uh, in the presence of another set of chemicals called hormones. Now um, how are these uh, DNA uh, how is this uh, genetic information passed on? Well uh, it's passed on in the form of uh, cell division. And so when cells, um, uh, let's talk about the case on the left, uh, when cells start out with a embryo, uh, that cell has the full complement of, of uh, number of chromosomes. It's a, di a diploid or a 2N uh, cell and that 2N cell starts reproducing itself through a process called mitosis. Um, as it goes through that process, uh, it duplicates the number of, uh, of, of, G of uh, chromosomes, uh, but each of those chromosomes is still the same as the parent chromosome, except for the rare case where there's a mutation. And so, as a result of uh, mitosis, uh, that uh, one uh, parent cell becomes two uh, uh, child cells, but they both have identical um, uh, genetics. The, the, in other words, the chromosomes have not changed through the process of mitosis. And mitosis is what happens uh, to our uh, human cells as we grow and as we uh, uh, replace our cells throughout our lifetime. And it happens in plants starting with uh, cell uh, division from embryos uh, that start out as a single uh, fertilized egg cell and uh, undergo rapid uh, cell division uh, and cell um, specialization uh, until that one uh, fertilized egg cell becomes a gigantic uh, a giant sequoia or a plant in your garden. Um, but contrast that for a moment now with the um, sexual propagation, uh, the division of cells called my meiosis. Uh, meiosis, on the other hand, starts out with the same um, uh, diploid uh, 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 chromosome count, 2n. Each chromosome has a, um, a partner, uh, but it um, is much more complex and it allows the um, uh, the segregation of the chromosomes to occur where some of these uh, chromosomes get mixed up or some of the uh, um, the genes on the chromosomes get um, reorganized and and mixed up through a variety of of uh, phenomenon and so when the uh, my, uh, process of uh, meiosis is complete, um, the number of um, daughter cells ends up to be four. Those daughter cells have chromosomes that are not the same as uh, the parent, and those daughter cells go on to um, um, fertilize or be fertilized by uh, an, uh, another gamete cell. Uh, forming a new uh, 2N uh, 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 fertilized zygote, or embryo rather, and uh, begin the process of mitosis all over again. So um, the, the very 
biggest significance of meiosis is that uh, meiosis creates the uh, diversity of uh, and the um, a variety of uh, chromosomes uh, in a population uh, that allows uh, variability to take place and allows for plants to adapt to changing um, conditions and environmental responses. Whereas uh, uh, plants that reproduce uh, asexually all of the genetics in those uh, plants, whether they're produced from clones or produced from uh, a, 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 a asexual propagation called apomixis that we'll talk about later, all of those cells are identical. Uh, they will provide uniform quality and traits, uh, but they will, in nature, uh, lack the variability that may be necessary for them to survive. Um, changing conditions uh, in the environment. So I hope that was a helpful, uh, very high level um, description of these two cell division processes and some of their implications both for plant propagation and in nature. So now we're going to move to another big idea and that is uh, hormones. And hormones are the uh, specialized chemicals that determine how plants will respond to their environment. And in other words, hormones are the signals that uh, 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 tell the uh, uh, and interact with the environment to signal uh, which more uh, organic, uh, uh, which proteins need to be created and how to allocate the limited resources of the uh, plant across the cells and across all of the functions that uh, uh, can be supported through the energy created through photosynthesis. But these hormones are organic uh, molecules. They're critical to plant function. Uh, they can either uh, function as a growth stimulant or a retardant. They can function alone or synergistically with other hormones. And for purposes of plant propagation, um, we use both natural and synthetic hormones uh, uh, widely. And uh, uh, for instance, uh, when we um, uh, will make cuttings in, the, in our labs uh, or um, do uh, uh, grafts of tissue, we are going to be applying uh, hormones to uh, stimulate the growth and and promote the success of those operations. So here's a list of some of the uh, key hormones uh, that have been identified. Uh, some of their functions uh, are, are still poorly understood and what is so very complicated about uh, hormones is that they interact with each other. And it's really the combination of effects of these hormones uh, that determine the, uh, the, the complex uh, responses of plants uh, both to the conditions that affect them and uh, over their life cycle. So you're going to need to go to the text and uh, uh, find other sources of information to get a better, under a deeper understanding of these hormones and how they are um, how they're used in um, plant propagation. So um, here's the other uh, big idea for today and um, many of you uh, are quite familiar with these uh, plant life cycles. Um, obviously the annuals have uh, go from seed to vegetative growth to uh, flowering and reproduction production of seeds and death all in one year. So they have to complete their life cycle and uh, uh, do it uh, just within a single uh, annual period. Uh, and, and the important thing about um, annuals is that uh, historically, at least until the uh, um, uh, development of tissue, um, tissue culture and micropropagation, uh, these plants needed to be uh, grown primarily through seed production. Um, similarly with uh, biennials, uh, a period of vegetal, a vegetative growth can occur over um, two years uh, with one year of dormancy, 
uh, but that plant will produce uh, fruit and seeds uh, one time and uh, and then die. So uh, again, production of seeds has uh, historically been very important for breeding uh, biennials. Uh, monocarps going around clockwise uh, are just another step beyond uh, uh, biennials uh, where they may have uh, many years of uh, vegetative growth and dormancy prior to having one uh, period of reproductive growth prior to, to dying. And the classic example of a monocarp is the century plant uh, which may um, uh, experience 25 years of, uh, of growth and dormancy but when it uh, does go into flower uh, it produces massive uh, spikes of, of flowers and seeds and uh, it's good night Irene after that because the plant will die and not um, come back to life after that uh, after that uh, phase and I think we all know that uh, the contrast here is with uh, perennial plants which experience of uh, one or more years of vegetative growth and then uh, move into a, a recurrent phase of reproductive growth where they um, may become dormant, but they will um, uh, resume their vegetative growth and experience another uh, perhaps many more years of flowering and seed production uh, prior to their death. And it's these uh, plants um, primarily that are so um, uh, uh, interesting and prone to uh, many of the propagative techniques that we are going to be uh, studying during this class. So um, these plants have a wide variety of, of um, strategies for uh, returning uh, from one period of vegetative growth to the next. Uh, some of them use uh, bulbs as storage uh, uh, organs. Uh, others use tubers, rhizomes, uh, uh, suckers, shoots, um, and um, they store uh, food energy and have uh, um, buds that uh, will enable them to resume growth from uh, one period to the next whether that growth is interrupted by uh, seasonal factors such as cold or periodic factors such as uh, a drought uh, perennials have the both the strategies uh, to uh, resume growth and the food storage organs and buds um, that we can uh, harvest and use or stimulate to um, uh, grow through um, various methods of plant propagation. Um, they are also, importantly, uh, able to reproduce by seeds. Um, so perennials give us the, the broadest range of options in terms of uh, employing plant propagation strategies. So your discussion question uh, for this week, I want you to um, uh, imagine and, and try to think through some of the implications from uh, this week's lesson and uh, come up with uh, at least um, one example of how plant propagators use a scientific principle to inform their practices and to help them achieve their plant production uh, goals. And then for your assignment, I mentioned Punnett squares. Uh, Mr. Anderson uh, provides an example uh, for the uh, students to produce their own Punnett squares. And then I would like you to design and describe a second Punnett square uh, of your own and to submit them both uh, in an uh, assignment on, on the Dropbox. And then for next week, uh, my plan for the lab is to have uh, to tend our initial plantings from uh, lab two, uh, to conduct seed viability testing uh, for um, the three main types of stored energy in seeds. Uh, those are uh, carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins, and I'll bring a testing kit and seeds for us to do that. Uh, we'll start some seed germination tests using uh, paper towels and plastic bags. And uh, my hope is that I can collect several species of woody plants from hardwood, um, from trees or shrubs, and that will uh, make some hardwood cuttings in the uh, greenhouse. 
so that's um, that's it for uh, for unit four, and I'll uh, look forward to uh, uh, seeing you in the lab next week.